I'm John Kadolf. I am two and a half of Kep three. I am John Kadolf, one of three. I am Borg. We are the Borg. We're the Borg. We're uh and then there's a guest. <laughs> Wait, the Borg can't have guests because there's nothing outside of the Borg. It's okay. We're going to assimilate him. Two, 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 I, I, I just feel like three kept men would be the two, easiest two, way to go, but if everybody wants to jump through hoops. It's okay. Two kept men <laughs> and a couch surfer. I'm Dan Carlson, um, a member of Two Kept Men. And I'm John Cadolf, the other third of Two Kept Men and a couch surfer. Hi, I'm Dave, and I'm drinking this, and this is why I serve couches. I'm drinking that in, in spirit with you, Dave. So take an extra drink for every drink for me. I'm, I'm drinking it in spirit with you too, Dave, but I'm backwashing. So, uh, well, we, we had to change up our, our, uh, our schedule a little bit because we were looking for the anthology and could not... Ethereal Film it. Festival. Yeah, it, it just seems to have gone poof. So um, we chose a film called Nina Forever, which is on uh, Shutter. 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 So this is uh, we Shutter chose it by Club. We, we, oh, yeah. Uh, oh. I was going to try to plug my single before you did that. But okay. oh, wait. <laughs> oh, yes. Okay. Now it's and. like, um, hey, if, if you dig the theme song to our uh, channel here, uh, that, that was me, and I've released the single. <laughs> Here's it's the available link. everywhere. Yeah, I, like every, yeah go by that. I, I noticed that there's like 600 Daniel Carlson's in the world. So um, the next time I release a single, I'm going to have to use like a stage name. Like, um, I don't know. What do you guys think of the sinful dwarf? Superfluous asshole. That was just really mean. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, how, how tall are you, Dan? I'm 5'3". Oh, well, that's not that short. This week on Shutter Club, uh, the three of us hastily watched Nina Forever, which is an artful. It shouldn't be artful if you if you were to, to describe the plot. I originally, when I th heard the plot of the story, it sounded to me like something John Landis might have made. And um, I've heard there's a Joe Dante film that's actually very similar to this, but goes in that kind of John Landis direct. Burying the X. I could see this movie going that way if it had been a com more of a comedy or, or something yeah. like that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we have um, a particularly twisted love triangle. So Rob um, has lost his girlfriend, Nina, in a car accident and is now basically working a clerk job in a shop and the word gets around that he had attempted suicide over the death of his girlfriend. And he's still very much in that kind of like mourning phase. And Holly, whose last relationship had been broken up because the boyfriend she had at that point in time said she was a bit too vanilla, sees Rob and decides that she, you know, she has a romanticized idea of what his mourning is. And the idea that he attempted to kill himself over losing a love hits her in this kind of like dark romantic part of herself that she wants to expand on and to feel more of. And they start dating. And then there's a small issue because every time that they try to get intimate, um, <laughs> sorry, Nina reappears. Yeah. Every time they're about to have sex, the chick from Hellraiser 2 comes out of the out of the mattress. Out, out of the mattress. <laughs> yeah. And not like okay. sort of like physical, not in some sort of spectral way. It is an honest to God physical body that is leaving blood and stuff. Yeah. And she's being horrifyingly sarcastic. She hasn't been able to move on either. And so you have this relationship of Rob and 
uh, Holly and Holly, all three of them um, are fixated on each other for the oddest reasons. And then also Rob occasionally goes to go visit Nina's family and oh my God, is that shit torturous? Because torturous. the family is almost more or less checking to make sure that he's still feeling the level of grief that they do for losing their daughter. Mm-hmm. And there's an implied sense of if he doesn't in their presence feel that grief, that he's going to be coming, he's, you know, a terrible human being and should be feeling a lot of guilt for it. Yeah, it's like they, they, um, they, they get um, their relief from seeing him in torment. And uh, I just have to make a comment about the first time that uh, Nina came on the scene. Oh. And, uh, you know, I didn't know what to expect. I didn't read the plot synopsis, nothing. I just saw Nina forever. I clicked it and watched it. And, um, you know, you see the blood start to, um, to form on the mattress. I, I thought Holly was, you know, bleeding. Yeah. So, you know, I'm like, oh, that's, that's not going to be good um because it's a lot <laughs> and then all of a sudden the hands start coming up and then she finally just just starts you know floundering out of the mattress and you know um holly's original reaction was uh, you know horror but um you know uh disbelief on rob's face and then after she slides off the bed and the introductions are made she laughs she's like huh <laughs> she starts laughing and then goes around to her side and starts to like connect with her somewhat. Um, it, it's a really odd uh, um, beginning. I, I mean, the whole thing is just an, it's just odd seeing her reaction. And, um, and then as, as the movie goes on, you know, sh- her empathy towards, towards Nina, um, she gets the, the tattoo uh, and whatnot, and then, but she's trying to do everything she can, and you don't know whether or not she's trying to do what she can to get rid of her or out of true empathy. But um, that's where that's where it, it I'm does, getting that from. The whole that movie kind of rides rides the line between healthy helping and unhealthy helping. Yeah, like like uh, making out with a, a dead with a corpse um, to make her feel better about her relationship with her living boyfriend to make the corpse feel better to make the corpse feel better (laughs) that she's dating her uh uh her her living boyfriend um and they have this kind of little threesome thing you know and the actress who who played um nina um pretty amazingly played a broken corpse yeah you the know, effects are great, but also her body movement and her structure and the way that she um, made she her aside from the blood and aside from everything else, just the way that she poses herself as she's sitting around. At one moment, there's the scene. There's a scene where Holly is trying to destroy every uh, physical memory, every photo, every this, every that of Nina. And Nina's sitting there kind of laughing at her as she does it, mm-hmm. but her body is posed in this really, what would appear to be this really uh, uncomfortable position. But at the same time, you know, you think about, you know, rigor mortis and the ways that bodies shrink and decay over a period of time. And her, her physical presence begins to reflect that. And so that way that aside from the easiest thing would have been, okay, let's give her some pale makeup, maybe so, some blotches and some blood. Yeah. but have her keep moving normally. But her body language reflects the idea of the actual uh, damage and trauma of decomposition. I was, I was, well, not I was, only the fact that she, you know, she had s- extreme severe injuries mm-hmm. that, you know, led to her death. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that she, the way she, you know, for lack of better terms, flopped about um, uh, reflected that really well. She did a, uh, an incredible physical she, job of that. And she had to hold back a little bit because if she because it, it although it has a comedic element it's not there's a, i never had an actual laugh out loud moment um and that's not a criticism it just isn't that kind of comedy it's but, a low, um, low key very very dark yeah. you'll never bust out laughing except for maybe uh, a couple of moments 
but it's it, it's an example of how humor is a reflection of our pain and how we use uh, humor as a shock absorber. Yeah, but um, I was going to say that um, she has to modulate that performance because if she goes too far over, she's into broad comedy, and if she doesn't go far enough, she's she's not selling it. The general theme is well, a couple of them, but the primary theme to me is that sometimes uh, you have to realize that the process of mourning is something that you still go through, and you know, for long, long periods of time and the ability to let go of that mourning um, is made better or worse by the people around you. And I think that, you know, the primary character still has issues with mourning because he has the family of Nina that he meets on a routine basis. So that his mourning is kind of, he feels as though he has to prove that he's a good, decent person by continuing his mourning. And then Holly also, you know, the more you think about it, the, that she is less in love with him than she is with the idea of what his mourning represents. A, I, think, a long, a general sense I think that's that. I think that's true for most of the movie, but I think she does come around. Yeah, at the end um, she does, but in the end, well, I don't know. There's a big spoiler on that one. So yeah, well, I mean, you know, we're we're okay with spoilers here. Um, Aren't we? Or 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 I'm are we I'm fine with it. Starting to get away from it a little bit so that people go watch the movies we're talking about. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I'm okay with spoilers. Just go for it. Okay. In the end, you kind of get the overall idea and the impression that um, Nina isn't back for her man. Nina is back for Holly, who has a, a demand and a need to feel on a dark level that she's never allowed herself to feel before. And Nina is a way for her to kind of tap into that because mm-hmm. she can continue to keep feeling that healing and that need to fix someone who obviously can't be fixed. They're dead. They're stuck. They're caught in a moment in time. Yeah. Well, and, and, I, and I think that's, I think that's the, the primary, you know, one of, one of the thi- the biggest revelation of the whole film. And, and I, yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, I think that um, her manifestation uh, is is due to the coupling of the two people involved. I mean, we find out at the end that um, one that, that one of the respondents to that accident um, was Holly, mm-hmm. and um, and that uh, that's how she met Rob to begin with. At the very end, it it made me almost think that all of this was in Holly's mind because she, she actually does save Nina at the end. You know, she gets her out of the car. She stay or well, she stays with her promises her that everything's going to be okay. I got the sense that she saves Nina at the end. I and thought that, that was a wish that, fulfillment more than it was actually that. Well, I, I, I feel like all of this, all of what, what we saw in the film happens in 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 either hallucinations or dreams or, or reverie or something uh, in, in in Holly's mind during this entire it's, accident scene. To me, it's almost like a feature length version of the scene in uh, The Rise of Skywalker, where he's talking to Han and Han's dead. He's not fit back as a ghost; he's just in his head. But we're seeing it because it's supposed to give us a window into his internal life. Yeah. So and, maybe that's what that is. I think. Yeah, I think that it goes hand in hand with, you know, Holly is in the process of training to be a paramedic. And, you know, you talk to people who are first responders and they, I won't say it's not so much a trauma junkie thing as much as it is a moment when you genuinely feel on a level that you've not felt before. And that, especially after the two vanilla thing and everything else, this is Holly's moment when she finally realizes that there is an emotional depth to her that she didn't even realize she had. Well, and uh, she wants to hold on to that. And she's been training to do something, and when you've successfully done what you've been trying to do, for, there's got to be a sense of accomplishment. There's genuine motivation, I think, in all of them to actually. Even the the the, the painful scenes with the parents, even though they may have, I don't think that their intentions are to bring him over and punish him. That's a subconscious intention, I think. I think intent on the surface, I think they're bringing him over to. You know, because um, they maybe they think they're 
maybe some it's a connection to their daughter or they're doing the right thing or whatever their motivation is. I don't yeah. think it, I don't think it becomes overtly conscious until they're challenged. I, I think that, that we see that they definitely have not dealt with, with, with Nina's death in a healthy way. Right. Yeah. Um, and uh, keeping with the routine because the routine allows them to feel like at any particular moment, Nina might walk through the door if they just hold on to it. Yeah. And she might. <laughs> well, <laughs> all, all we had to see was, was, uh, was Holly and Rob, you know, start making out in the living room and, uh, you know, there's their daughter. <laughs> Bloodied, bruised up and broken. But yeah. Then, there uh, there's the monkey's paw element to that. Yeah. 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 Um, it, also I think, telltale heart. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, Dave was saying that he didn't think this was much of a horror movie and I kind of agree. And I know John has, um, um, what's the word? Uh, he's actually gone on rants on our show. Cause I keep choosing movies that are not horror that are, yeah, that are yeah. horror, but not horror. Yeah. Now John has chosen one. So I have a smug satisfaction in that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, why don't you explain explain a little bit uh, what what is your take on 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 the genre? To me, it's a okay. This in a weird sort of the, the and I, I'm probably going to watch it as many times as I, I'm going to uh, as I do the film. I'm going to compare it to in a weird sort of way. This is a British and very twisted. This is kind of like ordinary people has a passing meeting with Monty Python. Yeah. <laughs> um, because if you've seen ordinary people, it's about the impact of the de of a death of somebody in the family, and how, like, on a subconscious level, that person is gone, but the the their absence impacts everything around them. Yeah. And in this case, I think that the that uh, Nina Forever, you know, someone has passed, and now their presence is kind of continuing their their absence. Um turns back into a presence in much the same way that it's a constant reminder that you lost somebody and you still haven't dealt with it yet. Mm -hmm. And it's just, they took that same concept of ordinary people. I won't say lightened it up because it got, gets really dark, but they do play up the dark aspects of the humor of it. And I like that. Yeah. 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 I, um, I would agree. I, I think it is actually, um, if, I, I, I was going to say, if you took away the really morbid stuff that's going on, you could almost um, treat this like a therapeutic film if yeah. it didn't if it didn't have you know because you're not going to show this to people who unfortunately because of the because of the imagery, but uh, in terms of the narrative and everything like that, it has it has very um, uh, there's a there's a channel on YouTube called Cinema Therapy where they 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 apply um, psychological therapeutic concepts to to movies and, and and you know relate them to life i think you could do that with this movie except that the people who most would probably benefit would probably turn it off immediately as soon as they saw a, a corpse come out of the right you know corpse come out of that's the bed. why i why i glomped onto it is that uh um it it, it felt therapeutic to me oh yeah. good yeah. And we'll let you share as much or as little of that as you'd like. Well, you know, it, it when you when you lose somebody and you don't, oh. and you can't and you can't uh, let go, um, it, you know, this this is the the uh, extreme end of it where where that person is physically there. But um, you know, I I myself, you know, with my father's passing, I I have never let go of that. You know, and I I'm oh. still deep within. Uh, you know, uh, a, a mourning process over 20 years later. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that, uh, uh, you know, seeing this movie, um, you know, showed me that, you know, uh, what, what I always know is that, you know, you just have to work through um, the things that were unresolved or that you felt were unresolved, maybe they weren't even unresolved. Um, you know, but, uh, I think that that's what, what has always kept me from, from letting go of everything and, or and not letting go, but just, uh, surviving it. And, um, uh, maybe integrating it would be the right word or I don't yeah, know. Maybe, but... yeah, I guess it's, it's like, um, uh, 
uh, it's just a matter of, um, you know, this kind of movie and uh, movies like um, uh, Mandy and, you know, other, other films that, that have uh, tragedy that is resolved somehow, somehow gives me a, a, a shred of, of hope that um, I won't have to go through those great lengths to be able to get finally through um, the, the mourning process, you know, and, you know, seeing, seeing the extreme reactions to, uh, to, a, to a death um, shows me that, uh, I guess, maybe makes, makes me feel like I am getting through because I'm not going to horrible lengths to, to get through. You know what I'm saying? It, it, maybe that's an odd way of putting it, but, uh, um, you know, I'm not going after someone to get revenge. Um, you know, I'm not, uh, you know, seeing physical manifestations, all of that kind of stuff. You know, it, it's, uh, it, it's so, a weird. So weird. no bodies have popped up out of your mattress or anything. No, so no. We're, we're good. Okay, yeah, that's yeah. cool. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Go hand in hand with him on that one in that. Yeah. I had the weird uh, situation of knowing full well that my father was dying. But he had multiple sclerosis. He was in the tail end of it. And still, the day that that news arrived, um, I went like straight into denial. <laughs> it was, you know. And the problem is, is that no matter how much you think you can pr prepare yourself for a moment, when that mm -hmm. moment arrives, especially something that big, pretty much helpless uh basically um I, I guess what it is is um i seem to to um I, i'm attracted to films that that process trauma yes in any way shape or form um i think the more extreme the more i'm attracted to it and mm -hmm. uh you know that's probably something for me to uh digest with my uh with my uh uh therapist but <laughs> no, i think it's I, I actually my feeling about art is that it's it, it's why it exists is to help that stuff i mean it's it's fun to have fun stuff but some of the most you know helpful stuff that i've gleaned in my own experiences uh, has been through a movie or a book or so. and i think that especially when you're talking about um trauma and um, guys and being American, um, we're really not encouraged to sit there and acknowledge, hey, uh, I'm in an awful lot of pain over this, and it's not like it's an injury, a physical injury. It's, you know, this happened, and we have never, you know, um, as Americans, and more specifically, I'm going to go with male on this one, we're really not encouraged to sit there and admit to an emotional pain. We're supposed to be above that or to kind of let it pass through us. And films like this really allow us to have an opportunity to sit there and take a look and acknowledge, you know, I got some stuff I got to deal with here. And that film yep. is really all about dealing with that stuff. Yep, yep. It, it, it brings a, uh, a phrase, my, my most hated phrase on earth, which is suck it up. Mm -hmm. You know, there are times, oh yeah, and that's the thing. There are times when I sit there and go, all right, I've got to get to the end of the workday. That's when I say suck it up. But when somebody is hurting and somebody's clearly in an emotional, uh, terrible state, that would be the last thing I would say. Right. Um, because right now that's very real and it's keeping you from functioning as a person. So let's take a minute and talk this one out. And this film is a much more low key version of that in that your trauma comes and says, look, I can't move on till you sort this shit out. And it's, it's the weird way to sit there and think about you have a codependent relationship with someone who's died, but a lot of us really do. <laughs> and I, and I think that that message is so powerful that, that um, Nia is there, not because she wants to be, or she wants to cause issue. She's there because she, like you said, can't move on until she is able to get her shit together. Yeah. And, um, that that's kind of a powerful thought you know if you be, if you believe in um afterlife and pe the the ability of people to move on after they've passed you know maybe their ability to move on 
and and uh, and continue with their existence isn't like so many genres base it on that they have something unresolved. It's that we have something unresolved. Yes. Yes. That we're preventing them from moving on. It's not their lives that mattered because their lives are over. Nothing can be resolved from that aspect. Only we, the survivors of that kind of trauma, can resolve things. And maybe that is a, a really huge step in the thought process of what keeps spirits here is that we're keeping them here. <laughs> and it's a weird kind of um, relationship in that you want to hold somebody in your heart, but you don't necessarily want to sit there and make it, for lack of any other way of putting it, a kind of not possession in a demon sense, but I'm claiming a sense of I possess part of your spirit simply because it's something that I can't let go of, that it was such an internal part of me that to, you have to sit there and kind of have a non-toxic relationship with the things that have passed. Yeah. Can, can, can I uh, relate Star Wars to this? And actually, of course. we have an entire trilogy where the new bad guy is basing his, most of his anger and his, his, on a misreading of who Anakin was when he died. Anakin had already moved past the person that um, Kylo Ren is trying to keep him being. Um, so for Kylo, he, Anakin, a dead person, has you know is still the 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 Darth Vader character that 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 the Anakin at the moment of his death he no longer was that person. Right. That goes hand in hand with kind of the mourning process in that you have an idealized version of the person who's passed. And it takes you a while to get a line on dealing with the reality of everything about that person who's gone and to admit, Hey, maybe they weren't always the person you thought they were. Right. Or that idealized vision of them and getting good with that. The acknowledgement that the person that you were closest to or that you hold yourself to was every bit as human with all the same sort of frailties the rest of us have is actually a really good thing. Wow, I mean, you know, who would think that a film like this would spawn uh, so many uh, thoughts of, of of this existential nature? Um, and uh, it it really, you know, it, I think it's a fantastic film. It has a fantastic story. If you don't just watch it for the visuals, I mean, as far as if you if you don't if you want if you look past. Yeah. what you're see, just seeing on, on the thing. You know, so many people go see movies and they, they, most people would come out of that movie saying, oh, that sucked. That was really dumb. Or, you know, because they didn't watch the film. They didn't actually take the film in. They just, they thought they were going to go see a horror it, movie. They watched this film. You know, there were some, some, some horrific parts in it as far as um, visually. But uh, to them, it probably didn't hold any meaning or or anything like that. They have a monologue with them with art rather than a dialogue with it. Yeah. Yes, and that's yeah. I think that this film, the part of the reason that the film works and the reason that we're able to have these kind of like existential moments about it is that it avoids a lot of what I think of as pop pacing in films, um, where you want to have the big moment where the audience blows up. And you know, this huge laugh or a shocking moment or something. In this case, even the moments where, uh, you know, Nina appears and everything else, and it's kind of a shock, everybody gets, like, this is our reality and we're dealing with it and we're yeah, and moving on. This is a low-key film that actually, it's kind of like, I was having this discussion with somebody about music yesterday. Um, there are certain songs that I listen to because there's space in between the notes and that space in between the notes. It's kind of uh, Pink Floyd's Us and Them being a good example. There's a lot of space in there to feel the moment and to let it kind of go through you without it taking over, um, without it completely overriding your system. You're allowed to be a part of the song. Um, I think that, you know, many aspects of art really, really, really um, uh, um, use that. Uh, effectively in, in, in if if you are an artist of that type yeah. so in 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 visual arts like paintings and things like that um, and even sculpture it, it's the spaces that it, it's the it's what isn't there 
that helps you to um, to really appreciate what is. Oh. And um, with the music, it's the, the the notes that aren't there that really help you appreciate the work well, in its entirety. Um, we are now kind of by design in a lot of ways a very information dense society. We are constantly being bombarded by things and you never really have a moment to stop and think about it. And this film is really about the moments when you stop and think about it, where it gives you the space to sit there and go, wait, that, wh how do you deal with that level of pain? How do you deal with the weirdness? How do you deal with all of this? And right. it gives you the space to really, to think it and feel it. And that's what I like about this film. I, I, yeah, I, I did too. I, I, one of the things I didn't think I was going to like it at first because the, the pacing seemed off to me. But then after, after I saw what it was doing and what it was going for, it, it felt right. But it it makes sense. It it, it comes together. It, it it reminds me of uh, in um, Star Wars the um, what is it uh, um, is it Last Jedi where she uh, uh, she she takes that um, ship and goes into hyperspace through that yeah just star stop. destroyer yeah. And everything just go, goes silent for a, a few seconds, and um, and then it happens. And 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 how the you know the audience reacts to that really kind of shows you where where people are. <laughs> yeah, because they actually had to. So when I saw that, I never thought it was anything other than a filmmaking technique to make me right. take exactly. that moment in. But a lot of people actually thought there was something wrong with the projector. They actually had to put signs up outside the theater saying, look at about the two hour mark. There's this something that happens where all sound drops out. It's not an issue with us. It's the way the movie was made. Yeah, exactly. And why are people at that point where they need that explained to them? But they can't. I, mean, I don't know. It shows you that, like I was saying earlier, people don't watch films to take in the story. People watch films just to fill time. And, you know, it's the people who use art in any of its forms just to fill space in their lives that have those quiet moments that they should be reflecting. In yeah. Instead, I mean, people aren't comfortable sitting and, and just thinking and reflecting they have to fill it with entertainment you know um watching a movie whatever even even if you're looking at artwork but still you know people you see people in the museums they just walk for, you know keep they never stop they just walk and look at the walls and nod their heads and they never stop and 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 just look you know it's like listening to music even Yes, Ferris, there's a scene in Ferris Bueller where they're at the art museum. Yes, where where they're, they're all, the, yes. where they're doing what he says. Where uh, Ferris and she are just going, hmm, hmm. but then Cameron actually stops and looks so deeply into a painting yep. that his entire uh, everything he's going through is in this little tiny piece of the painting. And then, and to me, that's kind of the thing, and that's part of the reason that I enjoy this is that i want to go to a museum or i want to sit down and appreciate um films or music or something with people to see what it is that grabs them it's not like it's a personality test but there is something when you sit i um i have a friend of mine who she is one of my dearest friends in the entire world and in many respects artistically we couldn't be any more different i am a rock and roll guy she is a musical theater and opera person and I don't really get musical theater and opera until I'm hanging out with her and I see it through her eyes. And then I get it. And sometimes I want to see somebody else's reaction to a piece of work because their understanding of it can help me get an understanding. And in this film, you know, that's one of those ones where I come back to it and I go, this is a film about understanding perspectives from three different, you know, three different people. Plus also, you know, Nina's family. And you know, one thing, again, that we miss on in our society is this notion of um, not just empathy in terms of how somebody feels, but how somebody perceives and how that perception shapes who they are. And, and, and I also, also want to point out that it, it could have been a very good commercial for um, uh, laundry detergent. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
And there, the there's actually a lot of scenes where they go to do laundry together. And, and the, yes. the, the benefits <laughs> of having dark red sheets. What, what did Pop? So what does everyone, including Poppy, think of Nina Forever? I'm going to give it a, a, a definite press play. Press yeah. play several times until you feel the way we do. <laughs> yeah. uh, I agree. I am also in the press play category. Is this a film I'm going to sit back and watch every few months? No. no but once a few, once every three or four years. I, I think it, every 10 years I might watch it once. Not, I've watched it's, it. I've it's, watched it's it. deeply affecting and it's not something you need to return to all the time. Yeah, I, I, I've watched it uh, two and a quarter times already. Wow. Okay. Uh, oh, I'll leave actually, it to you guys. Allow, me to, allow me to plug something, too, now that I think about it. Sure. Yeah. Um, I have a Twitch channel. Um, you can find me at RagingKelt23. RagingKelt23. Yes. All one word. Um, and one part of it has been me um, playing Fallout 3 and being goofy all the way over it. And I've also sat down and talked with my bandmate, Dave Vosberg. And we're going to do some uh, Twitch streaming of some of the sessions of us do working on our record. So oh, cool. uh, oh, I'll God. start scheduling that and putting that up. Thank <laughs> you.